Hey everybody, Danny Ritchie again here at GR Research. Today shooting the uh, second ever episode of Tuesday's Tech Talks. This Tuesday we're going to be talking about the issue of comb filtering. Uh, so for all my friends and family and my daughter Jessica who are checking in to see me on a video, uh, I think Jessica made it through about seven minutes last time uh, before checking out because it was just all technical talk, blah, 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 blah. And she had other things to do. Okay, Jessica and all those friends and family, this is your opportunity. You've seen me now on video and the technical discussion is now going to begin. But seriously though, for all of you who are watching who want to know about comb filtering and what it is and how it works, I'm gonna to try to present this in a way that you will completely understand it. Uh, even Jessica would understand it if she cared. Comb filtering is much like how it sounds, it is filtering that is taking place acoustically. So you've got the output of two different sources arriving in time in such a way that they're out of phase or out of time with each other and the wavelengths collide because they're arriving at or close to 180 degrees in delay from one another. So they're causing a cancellation rather than a summation. Typically when you hear uh, two different sources, we have output from two different sources, like here we have a couple different little drivers. Um, you think one plus one equals two. That means the output of this driver plus the output of this driver will be double the output. And at some frequencies, that's the case. But at other frequency ranges, depending on the time arrival, one may arrive in time out of phase, or in other words, delayed in time versus the other, and it will cause a cancellation effect. So you get one plus one equals less than both of them. You'll get minus one or something. So that's in a nutshell what's happening but it it also depends on frequency so it's basically frequency versus distance as far as the time arrival and how they arrive out of phase let's start with understanding wavelengths the lowest wavelength we hear would be 20 hertz 20 hertz wavelength would be 56 and a half feet long so imagine the output leaving the driver and it causes a wave so you got you got an up and a down and back to the, back to the same point again with a 20 hertz note, that's 56 feet long. So that's a very long wavelength. So if you have two different sources playing that same 20 hertz wavelength and you moved one back in time versus the other a couple of feet, you're still only creating not even a 10 degree phase rotation. In other words, uh, the wavelengths are so long that the output of one arrived just right behind the other and it sounded exactly the same. So you're not really changing anything. But as you move up in frequency, the wavelengths get shorter and shorter. And I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, 40 hertz wavelength, for instance, it's half of what it was at 20 hertz. So you got 28 and a quarter feet long. So still really long wavelength. Even as you jump up to 100 hertz, 100 hertz wavelength is 11.3 feet long. So still fairly long wavelengths down there in the lower frequency range. As you start moving up, up above into the upper mid-range area, uh, 1 kHertz, 1 kHertz, that's 1,000 hertz. That wavelength is um, 1.13 feet, so a little more than a foot long. At jumping up to 2 kHertz, then you're, you're half that again. You're, you're 6.78 inches. Now, you're in inches of, of length. Uh, jumping way up there to 10 k hertz, we're up there at the top of our range, we can hear almost. A 10 k hertz note is less than an inch and three eighths of an inch long, it's 1.356 inches. And then at the very top of our hearing range at 20 k hertz, that wavelength is only 0.678 inches. So really short wavelengths. Imagine those really short wavelengths, imagine them as little bitty waves. And so if you take one driver versus the other driver, say at 10 k hertz, and you just move it back a half of an inch, you're already nearly half a wavelength out of phase. So the time arrival of one versus the time arrival of the other at the listening position or at the measuring position will show that they're arriving out of phase. And when they arrive out of phase, they're canceling each other out. In other words, the waveforms are doing this. They're at the same amplitude, at the same frequency, at the same distance. They're going to give you less output than what you'd get with a single driver. And we see that in even two-way designs. 
Say we have a, a, a woofer and a tweeter. Here we have just a, a woofer and a little tweeter. And these little small ones make it easy for me to hold and demonstrate. Let's say we've got a two-way design. We have a crossing over point. We have the output of a woofer and the output of the tweeter. We have a tweeter that's down and output at a point where we want, to, want it to cross. So it's 6 dB down where it crosses over to the output of the woofer, where it's 6 dB down. And where they sum, if they're in phase, that means the wavelengths are arriving at the same time. At, and then that will cause you a flat response. The, the reverse, though, can easily be true. And, and there's ways we test it in our industry. There's a test that we'll do called a reverse null test, which just means we reverse the polarity on the tweeter and it now is out of phase or out of time with the woofer. So where they're crossing, where they're both 6 dB down, instead of you getting gain, you actually get cancellation. So instead, you get a null there. You'll get a deep 15 dB hole. Ideally, that's what we look for. If the time arrival is correct and when one is out of phase or the polarity is flipped on it, if we can create that 15 dB hole, that means we know when we flip it back it's absolutely in phase, which is what we're shooting for. And we want it to be ideally in phase over a wide range. That means if the measurement microphone or the, or the ear of the listener uh, can be within a certain range and the drivers are still very much in phase, which means um, several things uh, come into play uh, to create that in phase. One, the crossover point uh, has a lot to do with it and the distance of the acoustic centers has a whole lot to do with it. So let's say we're crossing at uh, 2K hertz, and we're on tweeter axis, we get a flat response, and then the measurement mic starts going up, so we go up four inches. Now the woofer is further away in time than the tweeter, so it's arriving later than the tweeter. So what does that do to the output? Well, at 2K hertz wavelength, that wavelength is still a little over six and a half, six and five eighths inches long, so we may only get a 10 or 20 degree phase rotation. So you may see a little reduction in output because they're not completely in phase, but you're not seeing a hole. But as you move further up, you may, where the woofer's further and further away in time versus the tweeter, you're going to see more of a hole form because of the late arrival. It's arriving now out of phase. And um, if the crossover point, let's say, were higher, let's say it was 3 or 4K hertz, um, when you start changing your vertical orientation of your measuring position or your listing position, those wavelengths are much shorter. So the same movement would create a greater phase rotation. So we may only move up four inches, but now we have a 30 or 40 degree phase rotation. When we move up eight inches, we may get to the point where we're 80, 90 degrees out of phase. Now you've got them not summing at all. You've got the same 6 dB hole in the response that you had to begin with and then you move up a little further and they may be completely out of phase. And if they weren't completely in phase to begin with, let's say there was already a phase rotation, as you start to move up, you may reach a 180 degree out of phase situation where you've got a big hole and, uh, and it didn't take much vertical movement at all. Maybe they were more in phase as you move down because the phase angle was tilted uh, and that, that happens on a lot of the speakers. You, I'll measure a speaker and see that they may be in phase somewhat on axis but as you go lower in axis now they're actually more in phase because the crossover parts, the crossover point, uh, the time arrival all has something to do with it. Usually the woofer is deeper than the tweeter on the baffle so the voice coil is further away in time so it already has a delay uh, the components, the uh, inductors, they'll cause a lag or a lead versus the capacitor. So there's, there's phase shifts and things going on there that all have to be taken into account when we design a network and when we design the speaker. And in the next episode, we're going to look at the problems that we see in a lot of designs that we call comb filtering issues. Uh, for instance, a lot, of, a lot of models that may have two tweeters on them, we're going to look at that and see how... Uh, by looking at the measurements, how that is affecting the response and, and how big of a negative aspect that can be. Uh, we'll see right here where I'm right next to the Clio measuring system. And that's why we're here now. We're going to do some measuring in a few minutes for the next episode. We're going to break this down into a couple parts so it's a little shorter. And you can drop in and come back without one great big long episode. So hopefully that's a little more... Uh, a little more to everyone's favor. That was some of the feedback I got last time. So 
Tune in for the next episode. We're going to continue with comb filtering and put some application to it and see what happens. Thanks everybody.